Good morning. morning. It must be a beautiful day out. (laughs) Great happy hour last night. Thank you. Is Jen here? Huh? Oh, she'll learn something. (laughs) It's a great time. It's good. The food, I have never seen so much food at a happy hour as last night. It was really great. I figured out that when you go to an event like that, if you stand around the table and just graze, then after you get your plate later on, you don't seem like a, like a glutton, you know. Just stuff yourself and then get a modest plate. That's the way that works. Um, so, would you check and make sure that your phone is not going to ring? No matter who you are or where you are in your spiritual journey, you are celebrated here. Um, let's begin as we do in silence. There'll be plenty of time later to enjoy the weather and the ball games and whatever else is on your agenda for this afternoon. Let's just be here. And may grace be in our heads and in our thinking. May grace be in our eyes and in our seeing. May grace be in our ears and in our hearing. May grace be in my mouth and in my speaking. May grace be in our hearts and in our understanding. And may grace be at our end and in our departing. And I've added to that that maybe because of what we do here, may we grow in patience, tolerance, kindness, and love. Those things. So I have a confession to make to you today, but before I do it, I want to give a brief summary of kind of where we've been. Um, Living in this sacred stream, which has been the theme since first Sunday in this year. There's several things that I could say about it. One is that you can't put the sacred stream in a bucket. It flows, so you can't capture it and say, ah, I got it. A lot could be said about that. Another thing we can say about the sacred stream is that it brings discomfort. We hear things, we experience things that we're not used to, and those things we have a tendency to want to push away. Appreciating and benefiting from that awareness means moving from one developmental level to another. And we've talked about at least four different models this year of developmental changes, psychological, spiritual, very cognitive ways that we move from one level to another. And uh, a warning that all people who work with these developmental levels say is that we all think that we are at a level higher than we actually are. (laughs) Just like all people think they're above average drivers. The sacred stream is also shaped by the territory through which it flows. So sometimes it's open and sometimes it's downhill and sometimes it has to find another path and all that. And then another thing is that the sacred stream is an experience and non-duality which you can't put into words, but I need to put it up there because that's what it is. 
This is kind of a summary of everything I've said so far this year about the sacred stream. Probably could amplify on a few points. I don't think I left anything out. So now to my confession, which is multifaceted. You'll be hearing bits and pieces of it throughout this teaching. If I have said anything, you think I'm going to say if I've said anything to offend you, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Spiritual teachers don't do that. But if I have said anything that has contributed to an illusion that I have any of this figured out, forgive me, because I don't. I realize now at 87 that I may be perhaps, possibly, on the front edge of having done so. But I don't really know anybody who has a real grasp of any of this. It's there. It's a map. Maybe we dip into it from time to time. I remembered while I was working on this class today a quote by H.L. H. Mencken who, who once said, For every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. <laughs> so, in its arrogant assertion that it has the truth and knows the answers, organized religion has done unfathomable damage. And though I certainly lay no claim to be one, most spiritual masters frequently say about most important things, I don't know. That's part of my confession. I don't know. And if I have acted like I did, I'm sorry. Now, in spite of what I just said, I do believe that the subject matter that we're trying to address in here, sacred mystery, the self, the cosmos, is the most important way we could be spending this time. I want to say that again. This is the most important thing that we could be doing. And, in light of my confession, it is impossible. When it comes to a social implementation of these teachings, it doesn't seem just impossible, it seems hopeless. I talked a little bit about that to Jackie on stage here last, um, last week, but we talked extensively about it um, at other times when she and I were free and, and alone. Uh, for, I'll give you a couple of examples. On the front page of the Houston Chronicle, front page Houston Chronicle this Thursday, there was a story about how threats of gun violence have already closed numerous schools across the Houston Independent School District so far this year, it's only September. And that didn't make much of a news because it's so common. Now, if our nation were a person, any competent psychologist would diagnose us as being psychotic when it comes to guns. If not a psychosis, it's an addiction. How else will any sociologist or anthropologist who might study this culture a century from now describe a society where there are more guns than people. And like any practicing addict, we are in deep denial. Just listen to what anybody says when there is a school shooting or a mass shooting of which there have been 400 this year? Hmm? Children die from gunshots than any other 
Yeah, oh yeah. But we have excuses for that. And you just listen to them. So my confession about this is that we're walking around a mountain that's too high to climb. And yet, without meaning to sound dramatic, our survival, both individually and collectively, depends on our climbing that mountain. Okay, here's another facet of my confession. I don't know where we're going. Now, you might not want to hear that from your spiritual director. Um, by the way, the difference somebody will, people frequently ask, what's the difference between a therapist and a spiritual director? A, a, a therapist helps people solve problems. A spiritual director companions people through their journey. And um, not knowing where we are going is a huge problem for me. I work better with a plan. If you call me up and say, hey, Bill, we need to talk. Um, my first response is, what about? Not, okay, let's get together. Now, I know that humans have always lived in times of transition and peril. Buddha's beginning point was life is difficult. And Jesus' repeated teaching was that if you wanted to have life, you had to go through the door of death to get it. Jesus and Buddha were not feel-good prosperity gospel guys. In our time, however, things have reached a tipping point beyond which we may not recover. When Henry Ford invented the means to mass produce cars, buggy manufacturers went out of business, more or less. That was not a big deal. That was inconvenient to buggy manufacturers. A boom to most of us. When Edison came up with the light bulb, candle makers went out of business for the most part. Not a big problem. We like electricity. When the atomic bomb was conceived and implemented, that was something different. Global shift, major problem. Again, front page, Houston Chronicle, this week, the sadist dictator Putin has said, that if Ukraine uses higher grade weapons to defend themselves from his invasion of Ukraine, these weapons will be supplied by the United States. He will resort to quote the nuclear option. Have a nice day. One other example, we are the first generation in history to know of global warming. And we are also the first generation in history to be given the insight and tools to do something about it. But while the house burns down, leadership argues about who started the fire. Was it human or was it struck by lightning? Does it matter? The house is on fire. You know, one of the best known metaphors from Buddhism is that the teachings of Buddha were like a raft that you use to get from one side of a river, I'm going to call it the sacred stream, to the other. When you reach the other side, the teachings aren't needed. Now, Jesus had a very similar teaching. I've already alluded to it today. What matters is not the bucket, but what you put in the bucket. Now, if it's true that we can't put the sacred stream in a bucket, can we build a craft that is worthy of the stormy seas that we are in, at least from now through the rest of the year? By the way, um, there are many, many parallels between the teachings of Buddha and the teachings of Jesus. Many books have been written about them. 
Um, Marcus Borg has such a book. What it shows to me, I think, is that both um, Buddha and Jesus were coming from the same level of consciousness. Remember levels of consciousness that we talked about? Marcus Borg says the only real difference in their teaching was that um, Jesus had a very strong social political emphasis. Now, Buddhism puts most of its emphasis on the games the ego plays, that is, denying the house is on fire, while Jesus emphasizes love of the neighbor, getting the neighbor out of the burning house, and then doing something about putting the fire out and finding out who started it. Now, the sad thing is that Jesus' teachings have been consistently ignored because it was fixed very early on that you couldn't talk about political and economic stuff in a gathering like this, particularly in worship in Christian churches. So Christianity made the teachings of Jesus very private and very personal. The questioning emphasis in the religion where I grew up was, are you saved? And are you going to heaven when you die? That's what mattered. So I have another part to add to my confession. I emphasize the importance of a daily spiritual practice. In case you were not aware of that, And I was made fun of again in the sacristy meeting this morning before worship because of this. And, I, and my, my response was, I will not relent. And Dr. McDonald said, thank you. So. <laughs> but if in my emphasis on having a daily spiritual practice, I have created the impression that it is a personal, solitary, private undertaking, forgive me. Because a spiritual practice that does not show up in actual acts of love, kindness, and compassion, especially for those who get labeled the other in our society, that's a sham spiritual practice. Jesus was very explicit about that. He never ended any of his teachings by saying, go and believe likewise. He always said, go and behave likewise. What in the world happened to organized religion that we got where we are? Well, starting early in the fourth century and to continuing to this very moment, Christ, the Christian movement has been so concerned with protecting Jesus, making Jesus special, making Jesus into God, making sure that people believe that, that in the process, the movement forgot the very teachings of Jesus himself. Even before the heresy that is Christian nationalism, Christianity has not been known for building bridges of understanding between various groups. Just look at the history of the Christian movement. You can start with the present emphasis over the split in sexuality in the United Methodist Church and go all the way back to Nicaea. And what you will find is that the church has made important issues, mostly abstract theological matters or issues about who people love, they, the church has made those important which ask almost nothing of us except argument that leads to division. So when it comes to finding our way for healing in this divided and diverse world, we don't have anything to offer but arguments. Now, Jesus clearly said that the realm of empowerment he was inviting people into was non-dual. It's the last thing. That is to say, it's both here and now. It is around us and within us. 
It is real and not yet realized. All of that at the same time. Now, the church turned that into a contest about future reward and punishment, about who's in, who's out. In, in one of his books, Richard Orr says that this, more than anything else, has been a huge misplacement of attention that anesthetized and weakened the actual transformational power of Christianity. It all got moved to later, and frankly, just for those in our group. For both Jesus and Buddha, rewards and punishments are, in, are inherent in our actions in the world. Goodness is its own reward, and evil is its own punishment. And Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. One master he had in mind was the world of power, and the other was the world of love. Now, I need your attention, because what I'm about to say is important. By the way, <clears throat> here's another part of my confession. We just said this is Confession Sunday. You know, as well as I, because you experience this, that there is no way that I can actually accurately convey what's in my head to you. Over the past few weeks, I have found myself in a variety of different conversations, in a variety of different contexts with different people talking about dreams, nighttime dreams, the importance of dreams. Now, I am not going to back off my claim that 40-plus um, years ago, doing dream work literally saved my life. I, uh, I decided to advance my psychological training by getting more training in Jungian analysis and being in analytic in analysis myself, and um, the, the focus of Jung analysis is to look at your dreams. As a matter of fact, if you're in Zurich being trained as an analyst and you show up for your session and you don't have a dream, they send you away. Seriously, come back when you have a dream to talk about. My analyst said to me, um, second or third meeting we had, he said, I'm not interested in your personal problems. I know they'll come up because we all have personal problems, but I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in your inner life. Let's get to it. So I would have a dream. It would be very vivid to me. And I would write it out in incredible detail. And I would take it in for my analytic session, and yet I knew that no matter how precise, no matter how linguistically skilled I might be, there was no way I could convey what was in my head to that analyst. Now, you've had that same experience when you've tried to explain a movie to somebody. You can't do it. Yet we try. And, and we assume um, that the other person has gotten. You get it? Oh, yeah, I got it. So here goes. There are two worlds. This is, what, this is what's important. There are two worlds. There's the world as it is, which is the world of power. And there is the world as it should be. That's the world of love. Two worlds. Spiritual transformation is almost entirely about moving from the world of power to the world of love and yet learning how to live in both worlds at the same time. Now, as we grow gradually in our understanding of and involvement with who we truly are, people made in the image of and conveyors of the mystery of grace and love, 
we will come to see more clearly the inadequacy, the futility, and the weakness that's involved in domination and control. And we will learn how to embrace and be embraced by the world of love. Any exercise of power apart from love leads to brutality and evil. And you can see that being played out in this country and around the globe almost everywhere you look. At the same time, any claim to love that does not lead to using that power on behalf of those whose lives are hopeless is mere sentimentality. It's emotion. So this is what it means to benefit from being healthily emerged in the living stream, the sacred stream. It is to find and realize power and use it for others and to find and be found by love and use that love in powerful ways. That's more non-dual teaching. Now, how do we do this? Somebody asked me last night at happy hour how long ordinary life had been going on. Since 1993. It's a long time. We're just getting started. So give me another 40 years and maybe I can answer that question. How do we do this? Well, <clears throat> how about we start here? How about we start with learning how to tell the truth? I want to teach about two things over the next two weeks. One is about truth, and the other is about character. So let's start with truth. We begin to build the craft to ride the sacred stream by learning to speak the truth. I'm sure you always do. You know, up until about 1700, perhaps a few years before that, people took for granted what they were told by people in authority. Uh, by people in authority prior to 1700, or around 1700, that would have been kings, uh, clergy, the pope particularly, tsars, emperors, chiefs, like that. At that time, in what we now call the Western world, which is, was much of Europe at, the, at that time, maybe a third of the male population could read. One in 10 women could read. I have never understood why, how in the world leaders of any country, especially this one, disadvantage so many young people when it comes to fundamentally good fundamental education, we are not educating children at the level we need them to be so that they can be responsible leaders in the future. Most of our children in HISD, even in high school, don't know how to read. And reading is so important because you learn to read so that you can read to learn. Now, though the founders of this country hammered into our founding documents the importance of separation of church and state, even those leaders, certainly the population in general, but even those leaders knew about as much about religion, their own as well as anybody else's, as I knew about the cosmos when I was in high school which was not very much. Today, more people know more about the cosmos, but still not very much about religion. The ignorance that is Christian nationalism has its roots in poor education. 
it has its roots in poor theology, as Jackie Lewis said last week. Many people, especially those who claim to be authorities on sexual orientation in the church, will state that the Bible is important to them, but they cannot tell you the first thing about the history of the Bible, how the Hebrew scriptures came to be, or the writings that are called the New Testament. Or the fact that during slavery in this country, Bibles were produced to give to slaves who could read. Bibles were given to them that had verses and sections taken out that had to do with liberation and freedom from slavery. We didn't make the Bible say whatever we want to. If you're in power. So most people still read the Bible to fit their already decided opinions, and they're not shaped by what they read. So it's paradoxical that though most Americans say they have a very deep commitment to their religion, their knowledge of that religion is as shallow as their commitment is deep. So we need answers about important matters and Religion is an important matter. If, the, if they're true, uh, they keep us on a humane, human, spiritual path, they're wonderful. But answers that are not wonderful when they're not true. Now, people claim things to be true that aren't true. Like, this water is clean when it's muddy. You drink muddy water, you're going to get sick. Drinking muddy water as a society makes people sick, makes society sick. So if the sacred stream is polluted, we have to be aware of that. We have to clean it up. Cleaning up this pollution means being clear about what information is available to us and gaining knowledge from this information and then acting on it. And in um, in process of doing this, in every religion that I am acquainted with, this is called gaining wisdom and understanding. There's a difference between information and knowledge and wisdom and understanding. So, major point. Learning to see, know, and embrace the truth is the first step toward wisdom and spiritual transformation. Now, Unless you have a mental condition that makes you a narcissist, a sociopath, or a senator, <laughs> you likely believe you tell the truth most of the time. Certainly we want to hear the truth most of the time unless it touches our very fragile egos in ways that we don't like. Unless the truth goes contrary to already our previously held positions, we don't want that to happen. Uh, my first spiritual teacher in Houston, who was a Buddhist, uh, introduced me to the very painful, painful fact that I lie a lot. This may not be true for you. So one time he gave me an assignment, and he said, I want you to go a week doing two things. I want you to go a week being aware of when you do not tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Whole week. Don't put a spin on anything. Second, I want you to go a whole week in which you do not say a thing about another person, positive or negative, unless that person is in your presence. He took away 90% of my conversation for that <laughs> week. <laughs> Just pay attention to what you talk about and how you say it. 
My lying is about control of all sorts. I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. I want to be well thought of. I don't want to disappoint somebody. I don't want to get in trouble. Um, I lie several times a week when we get the mail because in spite of an oath that I took some time ago about not to buy any more new magic, <laughs> I break that oath and it still comes in the mail and Sherry will get the package and say, what is this? And I will say, it's educational material. And I rationalize all this as being polite, being funny. It's all about control. When you compliment somebody on a meal they prepared you didn't actually care for, we call that a socially appropriate exchange. It's okay, I guess. But as the subject matter in question gets more consequential, lying becomes more damaging. After the 2016 election, in 2018 actually, a hundred prominent religious leaders representing all faith traditions in this country issued a declaration called Reclaiming Jesus. Now this is interesting. By the way, this document is on the Ordinary Life website. Under resources, you can find um, Reclaiming Jesus and... Um, Commitment to compassion or compassion or whatever it is. It's on, it's on the web, website. What's amazing by this, that's called Reclaiming Jesus, Jim Wallace had a huge play in, in getting it written, um, is it signed by, by um, Jews, by Buddhists, by Islamic people, by atheists, and it's called Reclaiming Jesus. So it's a great document. I'll, I, I'm going to read you a smidgen of it. We reject the pattern of lying that is invading our political and civil life. Politicians, like the rest of us, are human, fallible, sinful, and mortal. But when public lying becomes so persistent that it deliberately tries to change facts for ideological, political, or personal gain, the public accountability to truth is undermined. The regular purveying of falsehoods and consistent lying by the nation's highest leaders can change the moral expectations within a culture, the accountability for a civil society, and even the behavior of families and children. The normalization of lying, the normalization of lying, presents a profound moral danger to the fabric of society. Now, here's the interesting thing. This document, Reclaiming Jesus, was not greeted warmly by Christians. By the evangelical Christians that became Christian nationalists, they didn't like that. Now, there's an irony for you. The truth is that we are in a time when there is an incredible distortion of the teaching of Jesus being done, ironically, in the name of Jesus. There's very little, if anything, of the teachings of Jesus in Christian nationalism. Jesus taught, and I, these are Eugene Peterson's words, I just like his translation better. If you stick with this, living out what I tell you, you are my disciples for sure. Then you will experience for yourselves the truth, and the truth will make, set you free. Actually, hearing the truth just pisses a lot of people off. Stephen Hawking said, the greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. And Plato astutely observed, what is honored in a culture will be cultivated there. 
You all know Joseph, the crossing guard. I love Joseph. He and I got a great relationship. And I left work uh, Wednesday, and I said to him, just trying to make connection, I said, hey, the Texans didn't do good Sunday, did they? He said, yeah, it doesn't matter. Because uh, the Astros won a Western Division. Did you know that? Won't you stay up on sport? The Houston Astros won the World Series in 2017. They were charged and fined for cheating that led to that victory. And when I pointed this out to one of my dearest friends who is an Astros fan, the response I got, well, all baseball teams cheat. Okay. Or not. Is it just what is? Is the response is, well, what are you going to do? It's kind of in the category of, well, all politicians lie. Most people, I gather most of you, would like to believe that you're watching a fair contest. Whether that's on a playing field or in a court of law. But now... It is common knowledge. It is in plain sight that the courts of law, even the highest court in this land, is stacked. Not in favor of justice, but in favor of a political party. What is truth? What is true? I don't know about you, but... I never heard or encountered the phrase alternate facts <laughs> until it was uttered by Kellyanne Conway about the size of the crowd at the inauguration of 2017. The claim was made that it was the largest crowd in all of United States history. <laughs> that claim got challenged. Why? How? Photographs. Now, if you were referred to an oncologist at MD Anderson and the MRI showed a mass in your abdominal region that might be treatable or radiation or surgery, but your oncologist said, eh, don't worry, it's there, but I got alternative facts. I think you'd get another doctor. <laughs> so on January 21st, 2017, Press Secretary at that time, Sean Spicer, berated reporters and said, this was the largest audience ever to witness an inauguration, period, both in person and around the globe. Now, to be fair, he later recanted that position, at least said he was sorry to make it. But in an interview with uh, Chuck Todd, Kellyanne Conway said, we have alternative facts. Todd said, alternative facts aren't facts, they're falsehood. Conway replied, now listen to this, because this is relevant to religion. Conway replied to Todd, she said, think about what you just said to your viewers. Now, her implication was, what you just said make our, made our side look bad. It made us look weak. It made us look less than. She went on, that's why we feel compelled to go out and clear the air and put alternative facts out there. It was justified because the position I already held didn't match the facts. Now, in an effort to help you embrace this new philosophy, Golden Books, thank goodness, you remember Golden Books you used to read your child? Has come out with a golden book of alternative facts. Now, for those of you in the back who can't read, 
This is a butterfly. And these are pancakes. Now, this is not in my notes, but you know that, that the thing that's referred to as a butterfly is not anything. It is what we have commonly agreed to call this thing. It doesn't make that thing that thing. All right. Now, there are really smart people, not me. I'm referring to experts in the field of the philosophy of postmodernism and the field of sociology knowledge who can explain how we got to here and how to many people what Kelly Ann Conway said makes perfect sense, is okay. But we're here also in religion and have been for a long time. Having, just having what I just said, just having that knowledge and information doesn't liberate us from the mess we're in, which is a precipitously dangerous one. Everybody online who's watching this, everybody in this room, most everybody, a few of you young people here can remember a time when any of what I've said so far today would have been deal breakers and they aren't anymore. We have gotten as a country into an emotional and relational intelligence regression where the clearly unacceptable has been more and more acceptable. How do we get here and how can we deal with it? We began by telling the truth. Learning to see, know, and embrace the truth is the first step toward wisdom and spiritual Transformation. Now, you all are familiar with this illusion, the frog in the pot of water. We're that frog in a gradually heating pot of water where the change has been so gradual and so acceptable that we have been able to rationalize dishonesty as being mm, okay until we are unable, like the frog, to climb out. Christian religion in this country, white male folk religion, has focused on re-icing re a collapsed cake rather than baking the bottom layer properly and going from there. Christian nationalism focuses on things Jesus never focused on. Who's in, who's out, who's good, who's bad, I invite you to watch a movie called Origin. Origin is the dramatic telling of how the woman who wrote the book Cast wrote that book. I invite you to watch it. It's very powerful and very educational. Saying who's in and who's out in the long run never works. Wise and useful religion is one that focuses on compassion and justice, one that pays attention to those Jesus referred to as the least of these. So we'll continue to talk about truth and what's true next week. And then the next plank we're going to try to put in this craft will be that of character. Now, I don't know what you put on your resume. Do people write resumes anymore? I don't know what you put on your resume, but um, there's a resume image that we all put out, I guess. But then there's another resume that's called your eulogy resume. 
It's the one you want people to save when you're in the box. That's character. Resume is what you hope people see. Real character is who you are. Right now, I would sum up by saying the truth is that if something is true, it is true all the time, everywhere. And if we hold that what is mere opinion is the truth, we live at peril. Evolutionary cosmology is offering us a wonderful opportunity to reimagine our religious and spiritual understandings. The truth is that we must be willing, be willing to become ongoing students of the truth. To be willing to speak it and to be willing to follow it. Now here's the thing. There's one other thing and then I'll shut up. We wise, so-called wise, isn't that what homo sapiens means? We're wise beings. We do things to ourselves and to others with full awareness of the consequences of what we're doing at the time, and yet we do them, right? One of the best friends I ever had on this earth, a, a, a guy I went to high school, we, we, we were best friends until he died. And he, he's, he smoked two packs of cigarettes a day. And when our culture wised up to the real dangers of smoking and fixed it that you couldn't smoke in a, in a restaurant, you know, we went through that phase where they had smoking sections and non-smoking sections. That's like telling the people at Starbucks just to put cream in half your coffee. <laughs> you can't do that. But we would go out to dinner, and maybe two times during dinner, he would have to get up and leave the restaurant to go outside and smoke, to come back. I bet I said to him a thousand times, well, that's a lie. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's about the truth. I said to him a lot, Howard, that's going to kill you. You know what he said? I know. As a spiritual director and counselor, I have said numerous times to people about a wide variety of things. You know, this is going to blow up in your face. I know. You're going to have a bad outcome if you keep doing this. I know. This could be the end of your marriage. I know. This could get you fired. I know. Sometimes when the inevitable happens, then those very people will say, why did God do this to me? <laughs> I know. One definition of insanity is doing the same thing, experiencing different outcomes. Or the general way that I put it is that if we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to keep getting what we got. And we will have no one to blame but ourselves. The major issue we face at every important level in our society, especially in organized religion and especially in politics, is what's true? And can we learn to see and know and embrace the truth? guess that remains to be seen. No matter where you go this week, no matter what happens, remember this, you carry precious cargo, so watch yourself, and I'll see you here next week. Thank you. <clears throat>